The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus told his disciples a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city, there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while, he refused. But later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Start out with this uh, Excerpt from a reflection by uh, the late H. King Omeg. Perhaps the widow didn't laugh all the way to justice, but she certainly must have smiled. And one can imagine her heart's affirmation, there is a God. And with this God, asking is the sacrament of desire. It is also the heart of prayer. To explain the parable, Jesus teaches the disciples at the end of it that God is and that God hears us. God is not an unjust, self-centered tyrant. So how much more will God hear and answer us if even a measly human authority such as this local judge finally gets it right. The purpose of prayer is not to put a headlock on the almighty God, forcing God to cry uncle and give us what we want. Prayer is not a wrestling match, Jacob's experience in the Old Testament notwithstanding. Yet neither is it high tea. It is a dance between importunity and surrender, a sure shot between missing the mark and hitting it, a combination of concern for the self and self-sacrifice. That is the mix of human prayer. But Jesus seems to be reaching here or teaching here that the only way to err in our prayer life is not to do it. I cannot recall an instance in which a disciple is rebuked by Jesus for asking wrongly in prayer. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, once came forward to ask Jesus, teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Did Jesus quail at their brashness or leave in a huff because of their self-centeredness in pushing their own agenda? When they asked Jesus to let them sit on his right and, and left hands in glory, Jesus did correct them for their obtuseness and told them he could not grant their request because that was left only to the Father to decide. But he did not lambaste them for their importunity when they had, when they not, had they not asked him, they never would have learned about true service and its cost. <clears throat> and they would have remained in their ignorance of what true discipleship is. The good news is that no matter what we ask, God will work with us to bring about good and a continuing relationship that demands more, but yields greater blessing too. It was common in the culture of Jesus's time 
for the two main groups of people that felt left out of everything were widows and orphans. And through the prophets, God had spoken about the responsibility of his people taking care of the widows and orphans that they had around them. And so when he tells this parable and he uses a widow as the example, his hearers were well acquainted with widows had no standing. A widow could not do what it says here in this parable <clears throat> of going directly into the court of law to demand of the judge some kind of justice against, as it says here, her opponent. And that's because women could not present themselves. A man had to do it. If her husband was alive and, and there was a beef that had to be settled legally, her husband would have to be the one that settled it or brought the case into court. The woman would have no standing and she would not be able to say anything. So this woman in the story keeps going to the judge, but she doesn't go in court. She accosts him outside of the building. Every time she knows he's going in for a case, she waits until he comes out and demands justice from him against her opponent. And she does it again and again and again. And the way it's expressed here as the judge is considering his options, and he admits that he really doesn't care about people and he doesn't have any particular love for God, he says, yet because this, weep, this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And that expression that she may not wear me out by continually coming is borrowed from the boxing world at that time and in the Greek, what it literally means is not that she will wear me out, but that she will do me violence. She will punch my lights out, basically, if I don't give her what she wants, what she's demanding, which is justice. And so uh, Jesus says, listen to what the unjust judge says. And won't God do that much more for you because God is the one who loves you and God cares for you. If the unjust judge, because he's been threatened, will give this woman what she's asking for, how much more than the one will give you what you need, whom you don't have to, as it said in the reflection, put a headlock on in order to make him cry uncle to give you what you want. However, the gospel today ends with the line, and yet, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And what Jesus is driving at there is, knowing that at times with prayer, especially when we are asking and seeking and knocking, like he says to do elsewhere, that we don't get what we're seeking when we're seeking it. We don't uh, get what we're asking when we ask for it. And we may not be admitted when we knock. In other words, all of us, I think, have had experiences of praying for someone's healing, someone's deliverance from perhaps an addiction, someone to get a job, someone to be able to uh, deal with the sickness of, of a spouse or of a parent or of a child. And people who find themselves in those kinds of situations, asking, seeking, knocking, and seeming to be ignored. And how dangerous 
it becomes when someone feels that their prayer is never being taken seriously or not even heard. Or maybe even more extreme position of believing that, well, maybe God doesn't even exist. Or if God does exist, I certainly don't seem to matter to him. The people that I care about don't seem to matter to him. And certainly the world around us doesn't seem to matter to him either. Because we pray for peace and there's war going on here, there, or everywhere. So when Jesus says those words, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? He's aware that there are those who turn away, who walk away, who give up because they're tired of asking, they're tired of seeking, they're tired of knocking and not being admitted, not being heard, and not receiving what they ask for. And say they conclude that this is all a waste of time, or maybe God is a waste of time. Coming to church is a waste of time. Believing all this stuff is a waste of time. We're here because we don't believe it's a waste of time. But yet we still struggle with unanswered prayer, especially when it's a prayer for someone that we care about and that it doesn't seem unreasonable to us to ask for their healing or their deliverance from whatever addiction or problem they're having, or that they would be delivered from unemployment or from really bad financial situation or whatever it might be, or that the world would have peace, that there would be justice. When people don't get the answer to their prayers, that's when, what St. Paul says to Timothy in this second lesson today, sometimes happens because he says that, um, for the time is coming when people will not put up with sound doctrine, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own desires and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander away to myths. Sometimes when people wander away from the faith because their prayers haven't been answered or what have you, they may find some new age thing online or hear about some, uh, someone who communicates with the dead and that maybe that can be of help. Or they will take in, into account uh, someone's scientific explanation and maybe just blow faith off entirely. And so they hear what they need to hear and perhaps what they want to hear because the answer that they're really seeking, that they're knocking on the door to receive, isn't coming. And so sometimes in desperation, people turn to those strange means to try to get an awareness, to get some kind of comfort, to get some kind of direction. And many times what happens is that it leads them into a false security or gives them false information or can lead them little by little astray from the truth of Christ. Jesus himself, when he's in the garden of Gethsemane, prays to the father that the cup of suffering might be taken away from him. But yet he says, but not my will, but yours be done. When we're praying for something that makes total sense to us and seems to be totally justified, we may feel like, what does God really know or care? Maybe it's not worth my effort. And so I stop asking. Maybe I walk away. We forget that Christ himself was basically told no 
by the Father in that moment in the Garden of Gethsemane. And let's not forget that even though he's God, at the same time he's a human being, it's as a human being he's asking this, and he's being refused. And he does say, not my will, but thine be done. But nevertheless, he is taking a risk because faith is a risk. It's a risk of trusting that what I ask for, God at least is hearing. Maybe it's not the time to receive this, or maybe because I lack the kind of vision that God has of the present, the past, and the future. That in God, there is no time. And so it's always today, and it's always a thousand years ago, that God has the view of what it is that this person may need. And we don't know what God's particular will for this person is, or for this situation, or for the world that we're in. What kind of things need to change first before the gift of peace can be embraced by people in the world? What kind of change needs to happen in the person's life? Or how do they have to be properly disposed to receive the healing from the particular addiction that they may be suffering from? Or any of the other issues that we pray about that maybe God has something else in mind for that person and not what we necessarily would want for them, even if it's the greatest thing we can wish for, because it might be that God knows something that we don't know and that God wishes something that we can't know for that person, for his, for her life. And so rather than losing heart, we're called to persevere. And God gets no delight out of our continuing to ask. But we are called upon to continue to ask, to seek, and to knock. Because we're not always going to know why God is slow on the uptake of this stuff or what have you. If you think of the book of Job for a moment, Job spends 37 chapters going back and forth with his friends and with God, but God isn't answering him about why bad things happen to good people. Since he was a man who insisted and persisted in his innocence, and yet an innocent person wasn't supposed to suffer, and there he is suffering. What is it that Job did? And his friends keep saying, you must have done something to make God angry with you. And Job's wife even says, ah, curse God and die. Just get it over with. You're so miserable. and You're making the rest of us miserable. Just get it over with the rest. But God finally does talk to Job, starting in chapter 38, all the way to the end of the book in chapter 42. And Job is informed by God that, you know, you've been demanding answers from me. You've been seeking this information from me. Well, this is not information that you're privy to. I can't answer that for you because you can't understand the answer. You don't have the vision of the lives of these people or even of your own life or of the reality in the world that you live in that I have. So you have to be humble enough to admit that you don't understand everything, that you can't understand everything. And that what I say to you you need to trust it. You need to remember that I do love you with a love that has no end. 
it was that recognition of that love that Jeremiah was trying to push across to his people in the first lesson today. One of the few times in Jeremiah's prophecy where his nickname, terror on every side, doesn't come into play. Because here, Jeremiah is giving them hope, saying that even though they have done wrong, and even though these punishments have been falling upon them, and that all this stuff is going wrong, God will still act on their behalf. He will write his law, not on tablets of stone again, but on their heart. He will make a new covenant with them, a new agreement with them. And that new covenant is what's made in the blood of Christ, is made by Jesus' death and resurrection for our, <clears throat> for our sake, for our good, even though we may not understand it, even though we may not have asked for it, but it's been done for us and will continue to be done for us because of the love of God for us. So we're called upon not to lose heart, not to forget, just like it said in the collect today, the first prayer, do not allow us to lose heart before you despite our wavering faith, but in your compassion, deign to be conquered by the insistent prayer of those who seek your blessing and your strong help. If we approach with humility and understanding that the answer to the prayer that we make or the request that we give might be no or not now, that we need to wait, that God needs to work the other things out first. We can certainly be resentful. We can certainly walk away. Or we can have that gift of the Lord's love and humility to be patient with the answer. To realize that it doesn't always have to happen when and how we say. That's a difficult thing to swallow, but it's the truth. To help us embrace that truth and to remind us of his loving and caring and compassionate embrace of us in our need. Jesus once again today gives us himself in Holy Communion so that we in turn can be those who reach out to those who are wavering, who are shaky in their faith, who are wondering whether they should walk away because God doesn't listen to them and to encourage them to be patient, to wait, to pray in confidence and trust so that God can act in our lives and do his work in us and through us for the good of all.